So uh, welcome to everybody uh, to this special session entitled Faults, Rivers and Topography in Memory of Patience Cowie. So I'm Hugh Sinclair and I'll give a brief introduction before passing on to my co-conveners. As academics, our metrics of achievement are usually presented as publications, citations and awards. But natural abilities to enthuse, challenge and inspire colleagues and students can get overlooked by this need to quantify and rank. Patience Cowie was exceptional on both counts. In this session, we will hear about her outstanding scientific achievements, but we will also gain insight into how her personality was able to drive the science and inspire younger and particularly female colleagues. Patience started as an undergraduate at Durham University and then went on to master's and PhD at Lamont Doherty under the supervision of Chris Schultz, who will be opening our presentations. After a short postdoc in Nice in France, she received NERC and Royal Society fellowships at Edinburgh University from 1993 and progressed to Professor of Geodynamics in 2011. She then moved to Bergen as Professor of Earth System Dynamics. Her CV is available online where you can see her many achievements, including being the recipient of the Coke Medal from the Geological Society of London in 2016, an award that I'm sure she appreciated as a mark of recognition for her contributions, which, which, which would, also have been challenged, would also have challenged her natural reticence to be seen as part of any establishment, a rebellious streak always questioned convention. Besides being a good friend and colleague, my abiding memory of patience is a tenacious questioner at meetings. Once she got her teeth into a problem, she would not let go until fully satisfied, she'd push the problem and the poor speaker usually to their limits. We hope that this symposium will demonstrate the important role patience has had in building our understanding of the interaction between fault growth and surface processes. Uh, and I'll now pass on to my colleagues to say a few words before starting the session. Uh, so hello everyone, uh, yeah, thanks for joining this symposium. So my name is Anna Lehert, so I was doing a PhD with patients in Bergen. Um, and yeah, she has just been an amazing supervisor for me. And I think, uh, yeah, in particular, what I really liked about her is that, that she was a very good listener. So she was, um, yeah, I hear this from many young scientists that the thoughts of the students she considered as equally important as her own thoughts. Uh, so in that sense, she's really a role model for young scientists. And I hope she will be a role model for the older professors in our field as well. So I will give the word to Mikael, I guess. Hi, and good afternoon, good morning. Uh, my name is Mikael Atal, and uh, I'm at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I came in 2005 in Edinburgh to uh, uh, work as a postdoc on a project with patients that was the Aponines project that we are going to hear a lot about uh, today. And uh, these were uh, challenging years uh, as a young PhD graduate. Uh, they were uh, really stimulating years and they were also uh, some of the most fun years I had, like probably some of my best uh, research <clears throat> years in my career. And the uh, patient was just an incredible mentor. And uh, we will probably hear more about that. And uh, um, yeah, I wouldn't be here without, without her. So uh, passing on to Laura. Yeah, thanks. Um, hi everyone, I'm Laura Gregory and I'm at the University of Leeds. Uh, I was lucky to work with patients for my postdoc uh, when I was working with Gerald Roberts and on active faults in the Apennines. Um, and you know, one of the things that I just enjoyed the most about collaborating with patients was the way that she attacked a problem and kind of never let go of, of any aspect of it and always sort of delved as deep as we possibly could into kind of questioning and trying to figure out a problem and her capacity to listen. You know, I really have to echo that, that you know, she treated everyone as equal and, and really listened to what you had to say, considered your ideas, even if they were completely bonkers. Um, and, and that was really greatly appreciated. Um, so yeah, so just a bit of housekeeping on the way the session is gonna run. We have six speakers. Each speaker will has about 15 minutes, which includes approximately three minutes for question time. Um, during this time, please uh, feel free to contribute with a question or a comment or even just a memory related to that talk um, in those three minutes uh, using the Q&A uh, function in Zoom. Um, we'll do our best to bring those questions up in the three minutes and then we'll also kind of save them to the end um, 
And I've just copied some text that explains that again, if you if you missed anything. But um, yeah, so we'll then have 20 minutes at the end of the session for general discussion. And we'd particularly like to think about how Patience's research has influenced all of us and will have long lasting influence in the future. Um, so think forward to, to future research and, and maybe come up with some questions or comments on that. And of course, you're welcome to share any memories that you have of patients that you'd like us to bring up during that discussion session. Um, and we've been told that we can keep going a little bit over if we need to. Um, and we also have a separate Zoom link if we want to have a drink afterwards with, with everyone that we'll share later. Okay, so I'm going to now move on to our first talk. Uh, so I'm very delighted to introduce our first speaker, um, our first invited speaker, Professor Chris Schultz from Columbia University. Uh, Chris was fortunate to mentor patients through her PhD at Lamont, and the result of this collaboration was insightful research on faulting mechanics and scaling that continues to have a huge and lasting impact on our field today. Um, so I'll hand it over to Chris to hear more about that, um, and he's going to talk to us about Patience Cowie and the Inception of Modern Fault Mechanics, a Recollection. Um, so Chris, if you want to share your screen and kick us off. Hi, I'm Chris Schultz. I've been asked to share about Patience's early work with me uh, on fault mechanics. Uh, Patience Patients' PhD thesis resulted in three papers published in 1992. They're, they're pretty well known. And, uh, and I'd like to give some historical context for her work so you'll understand sort of the, the breadth of her contribution to this area. Patients uh, approached me first about being her thesis advisor in the fall of 89. At that time, my own research was at an impasse. I just finished the first edition of my book. And in so writing, I, I discovered the major gaps in our field. The most glaring, glaring of this was that we knew nothing about the mechanics of faulting. We had no idea how faults formed or how they propagated and grew. All we had in that time were Anderson's theory, which of course didn't say anything about those questions. And most brittle fracture theory up to that time was restricted to tensile fracture problems. In fact, if you applied, tried to apply fracture mechanics to shear fractures, you immediately ran into a dead end because all that fracture mechanics told you was that if you try to drive a shear crack, that you just get these arrays of tension cracks along the edges as shown. And if you do experiments, you get the same result. So, but what we really want to know is how the shear crack grows in its own plane, which is, of course, what must happen to explain faults. So we were absolutely stuck. So I, I suggested to patients that she should try to see if she could apply the Dugdale model to faulting. Now, I have to go back and explain some background on that. Fraction mechanics was developed in the 50s. And at that time, there were a lot of issues about it, uh, which were later sort of brushed under the rug. The most important one was the stress singularity was implicit in elastic crack theory. And it's non-physical because a real material would yield by some inelastic process in the high stress region near the crack tip. So in response to this issue, Dugdale and later Berenblatt developed what are called cohesion zone models to sort of look into this uh, issue. So this up here on the upper left shows a sketch of the Dugdale model and what it's trying to do. It, it assumes that there's this yield stress all applied around the, the crack tip, such that that yield stress has to be um, exceeded in order for the crack to open. And you're gonna open along some breakdown zone length S. So as a real result down here, at the bottom you see that gets rid of the stress concentration, which is now spread out over the breakdown zone. Now the way patients viewed this in terms of faulting 
was, oh goodness, was shown up in the upper right. So you assume that beyond the crack tip, beyond the fall tip, the, the, the rock was all broken, fractured due to the high stress there. And that is, was observed experimentally already. And that as it went further in, these cracks started to coalesce into forming a fault, sort of a proto-fault, which eventually formed a full fault. Uh, and so on the bottom here, you see the stress uh, as patients observe it, there's an applied stress sigma A. And at the tip of the crack, that reaches the yield stress sigma zero, which gradually breaks down until it reaches the final friction stress in the interior of the fault. Now this particular figure from her paper is the most important figure in her paper. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes on it uh, <clears throat> because it has to do with this way that things must scale. So in the upper right, you show the idea of as the fault grows, what happens to this breakdown zone S? In this first assumption, it's assumed to be constant, scale independent. And the shaded zone underneath gives the fracture energy. So that means over on the left here, that fracture energy G is a constant. And in that case, D max, the maximum slip on the fault, scales as length of the fault to the square root. In that case, the driving stress to drive the fault will decrease with fault length. I'm sorry about this problem, as shown here. So it decreases the fault length. That means the fault gets weaker as it gets longer. And that implicitly contains an instability. And of course, that's the Griffith instability. So this is the Griffith model. So the idea that there's this instability doesn't seem very, pro very likely uh, in terms of our observation of faulty. So she looked at this lower, lower right uh, version in which S scales linearly with fault length. In that case, G scales with L and D max also scales linearly with L. So in that case, the fault grows self-similarly and it has constant strength. So it's a stable fault model. The faults are stable at all times and they just grow self-similarly. So that sounds much more physical uh, but at that time, there was some data that indicated that maybe D max increases as L an exponent greater than one. And so what's the consequence of that? In that case, S must grow with faster than linearly with, with crack length. Uh, in that case, the strength of the fault increases with length and eventually the applied stress will reach the uh, yield stress, in which case the fault can't grow any longer. The rock just crushes, it doesn't make a fault. So that means there's an upper limit of fault growth in this case. And G increases with L. So that's kind of, that upper limit of fault growth sounds a little unphysical compared to what we think about faults. So we better look carefully at that data that indicates this nonlinear uh, relationship between G and L. And that's shown on this slide where we show results of D max going as L to the N power. Over on the right, it's N goes as one and a half. And I wanna look at this data. It turns out the data is pretty questionable in these plots. First, this Menard plot, which is all the long, all the longest of these data points is, shows the offset of the East Pacific rise at fracture zones plotted against the total length of fracture zones. That's a pre-transformed fault hypothesis paper. And of course the transformed fault hypothesis falsified that whole idea. So those data have to be thrown out. Then this big group of data from Macmillan turns out to be an unpublished bachelor's thesis from Carleton University. And if you bothered to actually track down that thesis, you'll find that almost all these data points are from plate boundaries, like the San Andreas Fault. And plate boundaries don't have well-defined ends. 
That is, they don't have ends where the displacement goes to zero. So those data also have to be thrown out. Over here in this plot, we have another pernicious problem. Notice these, these, these um, diamond shapes. Those are the original Canadian thrust faults of Elliot. And Elliot himself in his paper showed that, that those scale linearly. And we can see that they sort of go off at an angle to this plot. So whoever was trying to use data that as a linear scaling to sort of prove that it's quadratic scaling is making a Procrustean argument. So, but the main thing is that patients recognize that Dmax on L must be a critical strain for faulting. And so that must be a stress drop over a shear modulus, both of which are depend on lithology and on pressure and therefore depth. So that means it's the whole concept of plotting data from faults of all different lithologies and all different depths on one plot and expecting to get a uniform scaling law from that is the whole idea is fallacious. So here's what she could do with this data, this crubby data at that time. First, she cleaned it up a little bit. And after cleaning it up a little bit, she saw, okay, it's sort of linear down here from the small faults and sort of linear up here. But then there's this strict, strong climb in here. And what's that? Well, that's at the range of one kilometer to 10 kilometers. And that's the range in which faults, of course, going from that length range, are digging deeper and deeper into the crust. So they're, so they're encountering stronger and stronger rocks under higher and higher pressure. So naturally, the L ratio has to climb there. Yeah. Okay. And most of those fits were in that region. So all she could do with this data, she said, she could fit these, these small faults in soft rock and shallow depths sort of to a linear scaling rock, scaling law, and sort of these long faults greater than 10 kilometers in hard rock to another scaling rock. But she said, this is really crummy data. So what you really need to do is if I have to find a place where there's faults in all the same rock type over a large scale range uh, to actually verify whatever the scaling law is. So we immediately went out and looked for a place like that. And we found the volcanic tablelands in California where we have these normal faults in, in welded top. And here you can see the data scales beautifully, linearly scaling between D and L over three orders of magnitude. So we thought the whole issue was settled at that point, 1993. But no, it turned out that people kept repeating like a mantra for the next 30 years. Oh, D goes as L to the N power, where N is between one and two. The Muggles just didn't get patience's argument. So here's the most recent results over here. So in this case, we see, oh, these authors sort of make a big fuss about this variations down here. But their general result is linear scaling over five orders of magnitude for strikes that fault in granite. So maybe that'll finish that issue, who knows. But anyway, the last leg of patience's thesis was to compare that linear scaling law for faulting with the known linear scaling law for earthquakes, which shows as shown here, D now goes as linearly with L for earthquakes. And if you compare those two results, it turns out they're now compatible with one another to show that you could predict the linear scaling law for faults from the accumulation of earthquakes uh, from the slip of earthquakes using the ceiling of earthquakes. So, so what, so prior to patient's work, all we knew about faults was that there were these discontinuities which produced these displacements in, in rock formations. And according to Reed, uh, Reed first showed the relationship between earthquakes and faults, but it, that took a long time for that to be established. But what patients showed was that how a fault could be treated as a sure crack with friction, growing by the collapse of cracks in the damage zone at the tip. Faults were now seen as growing in three dimensions, following well-defined scaling laws as slip accumulated by earthquakes, or creep as the case may be. This new viewpoint 
has guided the work of mechanics of faulting for the past 30 years. Much progress has been made, which greatly expanded and elaborated the basic template proposed by Cowley. So the inception of this modern era of fault mechanics stems from the foundational work of Patience Cowley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was really interesting to kind of hear your perspective on, on that work. Um, we don't have any questions yet, but I'll give people a minute to put some in. Otherwise we can move on to our next talk. Um, but uh, maybe you could comment on, you know, did, did you ever speak to patients about kind of adding things in like creep and, and all of the other weird and wonderful ways that that faults can slip besides an earthquakes into your thoughts on on displacement length and, and magnitude. Oh, I think that was obvious. There was no particular point in this, but what, however you get displacement, it's got a it's got a scale with length because if you increase this, if you're at the equilibrium d to l ratio, and you increase the displacement, then you increase the stress concentration of the chip, so the chip must lengthen. Mm. By whatever, by whatever man, manner you do that. Yeah, I guess you don't have the kind of, I always think of an earthquake as having a damage zone around it because it is such a you know strong uh, force that's exerted by the slip, by the rupture itself. Oh, yeah, you do have a little bit damage zone, a little propagating damage zone that goes and hits the dam bigger damage zone at the end and goes plunk and increases it. But if you, but if you slip to fall, by creep, it's also going to increase the stress concentration mm -hmm. of the chip and increase the damage zone there that way too. Um, do any of our panelists have a question? If not, we can move on. I'd like to add one thing. Yeah. Lately, there have been a lot of people who've been, been talking about faults that grow by lengthening without increasing the slip. And that, of course, can occur by coalescence at the chip. And coalescence will, uh, of course, increase the length, but then the fault's out of equilibrium. The length is too long for the displacement. So then the displacement can keep increasing on the fault without increasing the length until it gets back to the equilibrium at the mm -hmm. L ratio, and then it starts increasing again. So there really isn't any conflict between those two ideas. Yeah, I agree. Great. I think given that we are pressed for time, let's move on to, to our next speaker. But if you have any questions or comments and kind of your thoughts on patients' very early work with Chris, please add them to the chat and we can bring them up later. Um, so now I'm very happy to introduce our next invited speaker, Professor Zoe Shipton from the University of Strathclyde. Zoe was Patience's first PhD student during her time at the University of Edinburgh. And I think Patience's enthusiasm for applying a range of techniques like fieldwork and modeling um, to, to understanding problems was really imparted on, on Zoe, um, who has since conducted groundbreaking research into fluid flow and fault systems, 3D fault structure and fractured network interactions, and geological models. Uh, so I'll hand it over to you, Zoe, uh, to talk to us about a retrospective work of Patience Cowie the interactions of faults in space and time and their influences on subsurface fluid flow, surface processes and earthquakes. Hey, thanks very much, Joanna. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Um, yeah, great. <laughs> so I've, I've put a slightly different title up here, Musings in Memory of Patients Carry. I'm, I'm not giving a, a, a science talk here. Some of our later speakers will be telling you about their really cutting edge science. This is a bit more rambling. Um, and as Joanna said, I was, I was very lucky enough to be Patience's first PhD student. I first met her when I was working for Rob Knight's Rock Deformation Research Group um, and went to help out on an undergraduate field trip. And there was this real buzz amongst the lecturers on the field trip about this person who was coming to visit. You know, Patience is coming, Patience is coming. And when I finally met her, um, we had the most brilliant day out in the field. It was, it was pouring with rain. And I got to show her around the field area that we're looking at, which was Lapworth's really classic section of, of the Moyne thrust. 
Um, and the two of us were the last women standing in the field. Everyone else went home to escape the rain. Um, and we just had a great time. And I was really excited when she asked if I would come and do my PhD with her. Um, and so I moved to Edinburgh University and straight away we went out to do field work here, which is along um, Bob Crantz's uh, fault mapping area, field mapping area from his PhD along the Chimney Rock Fault Array. My brief really was to look for that tip zone that Chris talked about, you know, based on the Dogdale Barren Black model. You know, can we see evidence in the rock record of that um, yield zone at the fault tip? Uh, we were joined in the field by Jan Vermilia, who is one of Patience's good friends from her time at Lamont. And working in the field with Patience was, whoops, was, inc was incredibly good fun. So the bottom photograph here, and thanks very much to Nancy Dawes for sending this to me. There's, there's Jan, Patience and I in a fit of giggles in, in the Canyonlands Graben district. Um, and Patience was, a, was, was very tough in the field. She had us up at the crack of dawn making coffee uh, very loudly. If you slept in, she, the coffee like, making got louder and louder until you woke up. Um, and then during the day in the field, we were taking surveys of um, using a total station to, to measure the offset. Um, and it was immensely good fun, immensely hard work and incredibly challenging. And then every evening we would, we would sum up with discussions over a fire and I'm, I'm quite sad to say I, I didn't get the chance to cycle into work into my office because of COVID. I have a, a, a napkin that we wrote our ideas on in, in Ray's Tavern in Green River, Utah. I still have it wedged into one of my PhD notebooks, but I didn't have a chance to go and get it um, to scan in for this talk. Um, so the, the, what I want to do in the next part of this talk was to really reflect on the kind of philosophy that patients had towards her work. So, and present some of the technical aspects, but really to, to think about the approach that she had, which was different from, or maybe not different, but really is what she passed on to me. Um, and this is a, an adaptation of the figure that, that Chris has already shown us, um, the fault length displacement scaling. And so the first, Thing that I learned from patients was that stress really matters. You know, you need to be thinking about mechanics. Um, you, you can make, you can't make observations of paleo stress in the field. You, you are making observations of the, of the finite geometries that are left behind by the actions of those paleo stresses. But thinking purely on the basis <clears throat> of, of the geometry and kinematics of faults doesn't get you answers that can explain the observations that you make. And we've, we've already seen this graph of, of, um, from Chris, but I want to point out these blue dots here um, was from a paper by uh, Ralph Slisher and, and co-authors in 96. <clears throat> it was actually the product of an undergraduate dissertation um, where some uh, an undergraduate went and looked at some really, really tiny folds that really blew the idea that the scaling relationship was had a, a, was n equals 1.5 or 2 out of the water once and for all by going right down to these, to these low levels. Um, in the Carrie and Schultz 92 paper, I love this quote, the unambiguous resolution of this question will require some significant improvements in the existing database. So this is an example of, of where an undergraduate student brought those improvements to the community. The second aspect that I from patients was really that, that space and time matter. And you know, when you're teaching first year geology, or, or as I do nowadays, geology to engineers, they're often looking at very simplified block diagrams where um, they're little cubes and you have a normal fault cutting through a cube or a thrust fault cutting through a cube. It doesn't have any ends. It, it, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's basically a, a, a very small slice through a, a really three dimensional structure. And in fact, what patients got us thinking about was that they're not just three dimensional structures, they're four dimensional structures and they grow in time and link and coalesce. Um, and a lot of this work she did during her postdoc time in France, she, she moved to France after her PhD um, to work with Sornet and Van Est and produced a series of, of numerical simulations, models based on numerical simulations that showed fault growing and interlinking and coalescing through time. Um, and that allows you to start thinking about how faults influence things like landscape through time. And, and that really seeded 
the later work that patients did on landscape evolution, on the influence of faults on, on river patterns and sediment deposition patterns and so on, which are important for understanding modern day landscapes. And in converse, using modern day landscapes to understand fault growth and earthquake hazards, but also were really important for um, the oil industry in thinking about how faults, how growth faults may have influenced the, the depot centres of, of, of where oil reservoirs would be in the subsurface and enable people to make predictions of what might be happening at length scales that were much below those that are imageable on, on 3D seismic data. Um, so a, a quick segue into, into my own work with patients, we, um, we went to this site in Utah and on, on one of our first days we were at this site, this is the, the, the Blueberry Fault, which is to the south of the Chimney Rock Fault array and there's Clare Bond from the University of Aberdeen for scale there. And um, quite close to, the, to where I took this photograph we found a pole with a tin can nailed to it. And inside the tin can was a very raggedy old piece of paper which we pulled out and it turned out that this was a claim stake for a mineral rights claim and um, later many years later i got chatting to one of the locals who said that that his father was looking for silver um i, I don't think he ever found any silver i don't think there is any silver in this district but um the name of the claim everyone every every claim was given a name and this one was called the patient's claim which was kind of spooky, but, um, but there we go. So um, in my PhD, we, like I say, we were looking at surveying the stratigraphy to try and look for these, these tip zones that Chris was talking about, and we didn't find them. What we found was that the, the displacement gradient at the fault tip. So here is an image from, from my paper with patients in 98. The distance from the fault tip, the displacement grew pretty much linearly. Um, and Again, that, that didn't phase patients. What we then turned around was to think, well, that's the observation, so the models must be wrong. And all models are always wrong. So how can we explain this? And it must be through the repeated accumulation of slip, each one of which might behave in that, that way with, with a, a process. Um, but the, the, the additive nature of, of fault slip smooths that out. Um, and the symmetrical nature of the loading in each of these rupture events smooths it out into a, a roughly symmetrical triangular shaped displacement profile. And then the, the final sort of philosophical point that I learned from patients was exactly how much it, you know, data matter. And the models are, always have to be underpinned by detailed data. And for geologists, that almost always means field work, not always. Geophysical data are important, analog experimental data. But this is an example of some, some really beautiful, careful data that were collected in Mexico by Estelle Mortimer, looking at how the sedimentary architecture of a series of deltaic sediments could give you information about the temporal evolution of this fault and the evolution in space, how it was growing in time. And um, in a sense, what, what uh, Joanna and Chris were talking about in the last question session about how these things are are not uniform in time, but they accelerate and decelerate and accelerate and decelerate. So um, stress matters, space and time matters, and fieldwork matters. The other thing that mattered immensely to patients, well, the two things were um, her family. And top right here, we've got her dancing at, at Cayley at Edinburgh University with her, her husband, Leo. Um, and um, her mentoring of younger career academics and, and at the bottom right it's the same Kaylee an image of her with her then research group at the time that, that Leo very kindly sent me recently um, and she was a fantastic mentor she was a great listener she was extremely challenging she didn't take fools gladly you know if you said something that was daft and non thought through she would prod you on it until she until you unpickled yourself from your own mistakes um, but she was also quite happy to admit when she was wrong um, and I'd say one of the big things that she passed down to me, as well as these sort of philosophical approaches and the rigour, um, was the sheer infectious joy that she had in the field. Um, and when I heard the news that patients had died, it was absolutely gutted and went and had a look through my photo collection and, and on the 
top left here is, is one of my favourite photos. Patience is grinning with absolute joy at the sheer beauty of the vault that she's looking at there. And that, that joy is something that I've really enjoyed being in the presence of and I've really enjoyed taking on and passing on down to my own mentees in my career. So thank you very much. Thank you, Zoe. Um, do we, anyone from the audience, you're welcome to submit a question uh, through the Q&A. Um, and in the meantime, maybe I'll ask a really quick question and then we'll move on. But Zoe, do you think that, um, you know, we can take information from those really small scales and extrapolate it up to the big scale? What are your thoughts on that? You know, where, when we're at the large scale and we have, you know, really complex earthquakes happening. Do you think it averages out enough that, that we can compare all different fault systems and fracture systems and, and gain an understanding from that? I think you can, I, I, I think you have to think about what happens at different breaks in scale. I mean, the scale that we can make observations on is inherently limited by our own scale, right? We, we, we can scramble around field areas a certain distance over a given day, depending on what the field area is like. Um, we can look up a cliff to a certain distance and more recently, you know, the thing, things like drone photography and satellite photography, that's changed that length scale that we can make observations on immensely and in really exciting ways. But you also have to think about the scale of processes and Chris has shown that, that you know, natural break in, in the data sets and so I think you have to take you're, you're using the small scales to try and gain a bit of an understanding of the mechanics and to kind of ingest, digest and, and reflect on the understanding of the mechanics um, and growing cracks in analog models, you know, breaking food, um, doing it in the kitchen. You can do a lot of fracture mechanics in the kitchen, but cheese is not the same thing as rock. So you're always having to question, question, question. What assumptions am I making at this scale or in this material? that are the same as or different from the, the situation I'm trying to make predictions in, whether that's earthquakes moving through the crust or, mm. or whatever. So I think it's that questioning your assumptions um, is really key. Yeah, that was another thing that I think patients always did very well is to question our assumptions constantly and, and never let go of <laughs> reminding us of what our assumptions were. Um, so yeah, I, we don't have any other questions right now, but um, if anyone else would like to comment you can. If not, then I'll, I'll hand it over to Mikel to introduce our next speaker. Yes, questioning or assumption is something that, yeah, it's always there. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sure we're going to hear uh, more about that. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our next speaker, Joanna Forwalker, who is an um, assistant professor at UCL. And uh, she's, been in, uh, she's been working on the Apennine Falls with uh, with patients and with uh, Gerald Roberts. And um, she's gonna talk about some work with uh, Francesco Yezi as well, talking about fault evolution, scaling relationship and hazards. Thank you very much. Um, that was lovely to hear sort of how patients' work has developed. And, and I can certainly second to what Zoe was saying about always being questioned by patients and being aggressively sort of made to be challenged as, as much as I could. Um, today I'm going to talk about fault evolution, scaling um, relationships and hazards, particularly looking at the role of fault geometry and how we can use that to understand um, the evolution of faults. This work um, I started actually back in probably 2009 and the first paper I, I woke on it, uh, worked on this with patients was a co-author, so she has very much influenced all of this work over the last 12 years or so. So I really want to think about how faults grow, and, and this actually builds on the last point that um, Chris was talking about. I'm going to consider the case where we have two fault segments which are offset across strike from each other and how they connect and grow and look at the different uh, stages of the fault evolution. So here we, we look and we see we have sort of some fault tips growing below the surface, gradually growing and increasing their throw. And eventually we're going to have some linkage at depth. There might be soft linkage initially, and then the faults will actually connect um, via on echelon connections. They might then form a relay ramp, a breach fault, and eventually a fault bend. And in order to connect, if they're offset from each other, we're going to have to have a connection that's oblique, so the strike will, will form a bend, 
um, and we'll also have a higher dip. And I'm going to sort of give away my conclusions at the start, and then I'm going to give you a lot of examples to, to show you how we've used our evidence and our data um, along the way. And as Zoe said, uh, patients are certainly a, uh, someone who says we must have evidence, we must have data, and we've been collecting more and more as we go along. So here we have an idea of, let's just take these two fault um, segments, which initially have no linkage, and we have those classic uh, fault uh, throw displacement profiles. So along the fault, we get an increase in throw at the center and decrease at the end. But as we connect these faults, somehow these parts need to catch up. So what we propose is that we actually get a higher throw rate in these sections which are connecting so that eventually the total throw profile will indeed form what we expect, which is that total displacement throw profile. But how does it know to do this? How do we actually have a system that allows this to occur? Because the fault you know, isn't just told, oh, you need to connect. It, it needs to actually have a mechanism for doing this. So let's think of these different stages along fault growth. And as I say, I will show some examples along the way. So we have our sort of fault um, soft linkage initially. And we have our two separate displacement throw, uh, throw profiles. We then have um, perhaps a breach fault scenario where we actually have an oblique breach fault forming across it. And at this point, our total throw profile will still have this, what we call a double displacement maxima. We sort of have the hump um, with a, a smaller throw in the middle. But what we're proposing is that we need this higher throw rate so that eventually we can get to a stage where we have this total displacement profile. And eventually the breach fault will develop into a fault bend. And what happens across this? Well, we're going to explain this um, through the idea of looking at strain across the fault. So if we imagine our fault bend coming across the um, and the strain across this bend, if we presume that we have a strain rate that's sort of constant across this part of the fault. Now, as a fault as a whole, we have maximum strain rates in the middle and they gradually decrease towards the end. But on a smaller scale, let's assume it is either constant or at least that it's only changing smoothly. Well, if we introduce a fault bend, we actually need a higher throw to maintain a same strain rate. And the reason for this is essentially just taking the equation of principal strain rate, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but if we simplify this to the case of just considering one fault segment here, um, rather than all the different fault segments that we might have in the area, if we do then presume we have this constant strain rate across the fault, which we do presume if the fault is linked, because at that point it's, it's just deforming you know, in response to external forces, then we can see at the bottom here that our throw is proportional to one, and this is this over the sign of the difference in the angle between your strike and your slip vector. So for a pure dip slip fault, um, we would expect that value to be one, because the sign of 90 is one. And as we get more oblique, that number goes down, which means the throw rate we expect to go up. So here's the theory behind it. And now I can show you lots of nice examples from Iceland and Italy, where we've been studying this. So we're going to start off in Iceland on the Thingvela Rift. Um, so this is in the southwest of Iceland here. And in particular, I'm, I'm going to look at a particular fault here, um, which is a north of the Thingvelatan Lake. Apologies for any of my pronunciations in any of my talk. In this part of Iceland, we have um, lava flows which have um, flowed over and they'll cover any of the pre-existing topography. They form a some nice flat surface. And here in particular, the latest flow we have um, has been dated from sort of between 10,200 and 8,200 years ago using carbon-14 dating and tephra chron chronology. So once we have this lava flow coming down, any fault activity that breaks the surface since then will offset this and hence we can get our displacement, sorry, as this figure has gone wrong, um, but essentially here we can see the offset um, from both sides of the fault. And this displacement, we can then divide the, um, by the time period to get our throw rate. And if we just focus on this little section here where we have soft linkage, we can get a maximum in our throw rate here, showing this soft linkage at depth, showing we have this highest drain rate here so that the fault is already um, connecting through soft linkage. We're now going to sort of jump to the Southern Apennines in Italy, and we're going to go to the second scenario, the breach fault scenario. So here we have, uh, we're in central Italy, um, to give you an idea, Lacqua's here, and we're going to focus on a very small fault here, um, the Parazano fault, which you can see on the mountain fault here. It's got a lovely fault scarp. 
and it has a breech fault at its center. We know this is a breech fault, not just because of the angle and the geometry, but because the total offset since the upper um, Cretaceous and Eocene is actually uh, much lower in this central section. But actually, when we then look at our rate since 15,000 years, we get a higher throw rate across the breech fault. Now we can do this in the um, central Apennines, a bit like in the same way we did in Iceland, but instead of looking at the offset of lava throws, we're now looking at the offset of a late, um, the last glacial maximum surface from around 15,000 years ago. So here we have the last glacial maximum surface and the same idea that this has been offset in this time and we can form scarp profiles across the faults and use this to estimate our throw rate over the last 15,000 years. And this again is showing that we have this higher rate across this breach fault, even though the total throw pro profile, which is shown here, we, where we have that double displacement maxima, like I showed earlier in the cartoon, um, showing we have this breach fault, but a higher um, throw rate across the center um, in order to keep that strain rate looking as if we would expect if it, if it was just behaving as a normal fault, or I say normal, I shouldn't use the word normal when talking about faults, if it was just behaving as a fault, um, you know, with a maximum in the center and um, decreasing to zero towards its tips. So again, we're showing here, we've gone from a soft linkage, we're now looking at um, a breach fault, and we're now gonna look at the case of fault bends, which is where we're saying this hard linkage has occurred. And here we're looking at another fault in the central Apennines. So same mechanism for measuring offsets. Here we've actually got some terrestrial LIDAR, and this is, we've got lots and lots and lots of throw profiles across the fault. And where we see a strike, where we see this change in strike, where we have a fault bend, we again see this higher throw. Um, but despite having the higher throw, we actually have a very smooth strain rate profile. So again, this is showing us that fault geometry is playing this role, giving us clues about how these faults are connecting, starting to behave as one fault, then being hard linked, and then this is continuing throughout its life cycle. If we go back to Iceland again, um, back to Thingvela, we have examples here. Um, here we're actually looking at the offset of subglacial erosional surfaces. And again, if we look at these faults and look at the offset across them, we are seeing uh, maximums across um, the fault bends. And likewise, we've seen the same thing in Hengil volcanic um, province. Um, and here uh, we've got slightly different age. Here we're looking at so about seven to 13,000 years. Um, because we've had dating with um, exposure dates from cosmogenic helium isotopes in olivine, and um, this gives us an idea of, of these offsets here in the time periods over them. And, and once again, we're seeing this maximum across the bend. So lots of examples from different stages of fault linkage and from different tectonic sottings, uh, settings. Both are normal fault settings. We've got extension. One is um, sort of intraplate and the other is in an interplate setting across a mid-Atlantic ridge. The role of um, rivers and geomorphology has been really important in understanding all these examples. I've sort of said, oh, this is an area of soft linkage. This has been linked um, at different stages. And we use lots of clues to help us really understand where we are in these cycles and to understand how do we know that these really are two paleo tips that have connected. Um, I mentioned in, in the central Apennines an example where we had the total offsets and then we could see there was a minimum. So that gave us a clue. In Iceland, we've used examples where we've actually looked at the relationship between the monocline. So here we can see a monocline up against the fault and the width of the monocline to determine tips. And we've also used river um, offsets. So here's an example where we've actually had a river um, migrate north in response to an increase in throw rate across the fault. And we can see that this is actually quite recent because we have a waterfall here. But you notice there's very little incision very little incision um, as a result of the waterfall. So we know this is a relatively sort of new example. So how does this occur? How, how does the, this faster throw rate occur? Um, these settings are both examples where most of the deformation or all the deformation is through earthquakes. And we're actually showing that we can get this relationship um, where we're seeing that higher throw across a bend in individual earthquakes. So we actually think that in individual earthquakes, we are seeing this greater throw across the bends, and that's how this long-term profile is growing over time. And here we have examples from uh, Mexico, Greece, the USA, and Italy. Um, and what we actually did here was we used the measurements across um, the co-seismic throw measurements. Um, these ones we actually did ourselves. These were from, from other authors. And these lines here are, are green and red lines here, are where we've actually modeled what we expected the throw to be given the model. So 
the red lines are showing you the sort of outer fault, if you like, or the, where we have the continuous strike. And then these green bars are what we would calculate the throw to be across the bend in our model. And, and, and then the actual lines here and the actual dots are all the actual data. So we're getting a really good fit using our sort of predicted results compared to the real data. So we think we've got a really good strong relationship here. And this is really important for things like scatter relationships. Um, when we look at um, looking at the D max versus surface rupture length, I've got two examples here um, from Wells and Coppersmith and Manigetti. And we see that we get quite a lot of scatter when we're trying to relate D max to length. And we think we can explain this through fault bends. So if we take these examples here, where we look at the examples, our, our examples here in blue, um, the orange line shows where, these orange dots show where they would plot on the Wells and Coppersmith plots. And you notice that all our examples, we had that maximum displacement across a fault bend and all of those um, plot above the line. And we think that's because they're in a location of fault um, bends. So they have a higher throw and that can actually explain, you know, perhaps not all the scatter, there's, there's other influence as well, but quite a lot of the scatter that we're seeing in these scaling relationships. Another important example is, um, sorry, my computer's going crazy, is from um, looking at fault bends in terms of seismic hazard. And I just want to make a point here, we're looking at that Parazano fault again, where if we look at all our data, or if we use simplified data, so a simple um, profile across a fault, then we don't get the same results. We, we get very different rates for recurrence intervals. And likewise, we get quite different results for our seismic shaking uh, individual sites. So here, I've, the blue line here is showing the case with all our data. Um, for the ground motion prediction equations, spectral acceleration at individual sites. And if we start using simplified results, we actually come out of the uncertainty. So we need to understand fault growth and the relationship of the fault geometry and throw in order to really understand um, you know, how we use faults in seismic hazard assessment. And so with that in mind, um, we, we've produced the fault to SHAR database, which uh, uses a lot of detailed data, including all the fault geometry on the faults and detailed slip rate data. And this sort of fault to SHAR initiative is actually something that Patience was initially sort of one of the people involved who, who really wants to get it going. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we are sort of keeping all this going. And uh, I hope this sort of subject, this talk has sort of continued on on some of the subjects that she would like to see to be continued on. And, and here we're showing you know, the importance of using the detail in our models. So um, I'm saying thank you. It's a double thank you. It's a thank you to everyone who's listening, but it's also a thank you to patients um, because that has sort of basically inspired the last 10 years of my research. Um, and I also leave you with some information about an upcoming special issue um, in a journal. So thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. <laughs> that was a really, really nice. Uh, so I think, um, do we have any questions? Uh, I, I just want to encourage people to ask questions. We've got the, the Q&A. So at the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A button. So you click on that and you can put questions here. At the moment, we don't have many. Uh, seems like uh, there are some questions coming from the, uh, the chair. So maybe I'm going to start with that. Uh, Zoe is asking um, a similar flavored question to the one Laura asked me. The work you present is all on surface traces of active faults and needs to be uh, uh, and needs to be to get that spatial resolution. How well do you think this translates to the linkage of faults at depth in the crust? What assumptions, if any, do you have to test in order to say that your surface interpretation are valid at depth? So yeah, it's a it's a really important question. Um, so I think there's sort of two different parts of this. Um, one is that we have looked at the total strain rates we calculate across the whole of the Apennines and compared them to um, the topography and actually then related that to a quartz flow law. This is work that I actually did with patients and, and Chris and Gerald Roberts. Um, and so this actually can show us that we have a mechanism for showing what we think the driving mechanism is. It's all to do with shear zones at depth and how these then relate to the topography of the surface. Um, so I think the fact that we do have an explainable mechanism helps us think that you know, these results are not just um, random, you know, they, they are important. Um, we also have compared the results we get at the surface to things like the GPS and historical seismicity. We get good matches when we look at the total strain rate across the Apennines. Um, 
but it's different at spatial resolution. There's a different geography of hazard when we look at shorter time periods. So there is some sensibility checks we've done. Um, in terms of evidence for how this sort of propagates to depth, um, we have looked at some of the micro seismicity following the 2016 Lacra earthquake. And that's sort of, you know, it, within resolution, there's agreement. Um, obviously, it's not precise. It's not going to give us the same details as we get to the surface. But again, it's, it's giving us a broad agreement. Um, we've also looked at um, examples where we've located um, the focal mechanism at depth for particular earthquakes. So, for example, the Colferito earthquake. And we've compared the depth and location um, of that earthquake and compared it to the fault at the surface and showed that the propagation of the fault at the surface does meet um, the detailed um, examples of where we expect to see that fault. So there are you know, checks we can do in terms of you know, really knowing does all the detail propagate and exactly how does it, it's still very difficult to do. Um, if anyone could do that and get the real detail at depth, then I'd be very, very happy and would love to talk to them about it. But I think that is one of our really big challenges overall is trying to relate what we see at the surface to depth. Um, but I think in geology, it's one of those things we have so little information. We have such a short time span that we see the detail for and we have such a small fraction of the fault that we get to see these details for. We have to use what we can. Great. Uh, thank you very much. So we have some question. Uh, uh, so, so I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to start with Vimal's question, and we've got another question. Uh, have you ever observed any noticeable change in the displacement and fault line relationship with lithology? Sorry, I didn't quite catch the second half of that. Oh, sorry. Uh, how the, the that relationship, which I think Chris mentioned at the beginning as well, is how uh, the displacement, the relationship between the displacement, the fault length, uh, fault length changes with lithology. Um, I haven't actually looked at that myself. Um, so I'm not sure we've. I've got a good answer for that, to be honest. <laughs> okay, um, that's, that's fine. Is, is, anywhere, uh, is anyone aware of data that shows that, Zoe, you said? I'm pretty sure people say? have looked at it. I can't remember off the top of my head what they found, but I would make the point that as soon as you start getting faults that are large, and when, by large, I mean large with respect to lithological unit boundaries, they're not sampling a lithology anymore. And when you're looking at faults, the scale that Joanna's looking at, those faults are sampling multiple mechanical units. Um, so those faults aren't in a lithology, they're in lots of lithologies that are um, mm. spatially variable, but also potentially temporarily variable. If you're talking about long time periods, then they, they may be changing their mechanical properties due to diagenesis or conversely changing their mechanical properties due to fracturing. Um, which can have big effects on Young's modulus of the material. So um, any studies that have been done, I'm sorry, Vimal, I, I don't know any off the top of my head to, to point you towards, but I would say you need to take anything other than very, very small faults with a bit of a pinch of salt. Okay. But I think that, uh, I think you can only see that for the reason that Zoe just mentioned, it's for small faults, tiny faults. So for example, if you look at the faults in the, in the British coal measures, which are really soft rocks, they have much smaller D to L than those faults, slishy, those tiny faults of slishy at all, which are in quartzite. So you really see it for the small faults, as you just as you expect. The stronger stronger faults have much higher D to L ratio, but of course that's all smeared out for long faults, as Zoe said. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. There is just one question from Ted. Uh, I'm working in earthquake direction and how it influences the atmosphere, how we could contact if it's possible. So if some people have some ideas about, uh, about that, uh, you can uh, answer to uh, Ted directly in the, in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I think we need to move on. So I'm going to uh, 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 introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, Joanna. And our next speaker is uh, Alex Whitaker. Uh, who is a senior lecturer at Imperial College London, and uh, we did his PhD, 
with patients at the time I was doing my postdoc in the Aponite. And he's going to talk to us about faulting landscapes and sediment supply. Off you go, Alex. Thanks very, thanks very much, Mikhail. I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, there we go. Uh, All right. Right. Hopefully, uh, everyone can uh, can see this now. So uh, it's uh, it's uh, you know a pleasure in a way to to be able to give this this talk and and, and remember patients. So I uh, really got started working with patients in two thousand and two. Uh, you know, I'd come come up from from Cambridge fresh faced and uh, wanting to work with patients really on thinking not just about faulting but how that affected landscape evolution and then I'm going to give uh, some examples of where I think the uh, her ideas and work really influenced some of our ideas on faulting and sediment supply from so I'm kind of going to start with uh, the the background to, to to some of this stuff. And that uh, really is all about how uh, fluvial landscapes uh, record active faulting. So, you know, when, when people started to think about, oh, well, do landscapes, pan landscapes, can rivers record faulting? A lot of that initial work was all about uh, numerical modeling. And I would, I would kind of point, point you to two uh, well-known papers by Kellen Mithel and Greg Tucker which really attempted to implement detachment limited modeling bedrock river modeling stream power modeling of rivers responding to a, to a base level. And what that, that initial work kind of showed was that in response to a, to a modeled base level change, detachment limited bedrock rivers basically developed a kind of nick point that migrated upstream in response to this, this change in base level. So these were all uh, numerical examples, but uh, you know, to, you know, in 2002 when this was published, nearly 20 years ago, you know, it was possible to use a figure like this where you would kind of show a long profile elevation against downstream distance with a kind of kind of nick point. And the question was, well, actually, wouldn't it be great if there were some good field examples of some good field case studies? And this is really where the, the, I think the brilliance of patience came in because she had been talking to Greg, uh, Greg Tucker, and she, she was basically saying, well, I've been working out in the Italian Apennines, and we think that we know what the faults have done, and we've got good examples of uh, faults that have changed their rates over time. So I basically joined this, this project in, in, you know, in 2002, and I've been working on rivers with Niels Hovius, and I kind of found myself working on a, on a super exciting project with an amazing uh, mentor. And essentially, you know, as, as John and others are, will have, have talked about, the Apennine, the normal fault array in the Apennines has got quite a, uh, a complex history, but essentially it and initiated, at least in this area, around 3 million years ago. And some of these faults have increased their rates through time as the, as the, the fault array has interacted. Uh, and that means that some of these faults have increased their slip rate. And that basically meant they were good examples of where we could then go and say, okay, how has the landscape responded to that? And, you know, patience was always really keen on making sure that we have like some really well-constrained field examples to test numerical models. Because, you know, she often said to me, you can, your models can make predictions, but we need to see what, see what, you know, the real world actually shows. So I was really, you know, I, I dug, I've dug out some photos and I, I was really fortunate to, uh, to be able to do lots of uh, field trips uh, to Italy and to elsewhere with, with patients. You know, I mean, it, it was an amazing experience because, you know, patients was, as Zoe was saying, it was like up early. I remember working breakfast at quarter to seven you know, you had to be on on the ball, but it was it was a it was a fantastic experience just in terms of uh, the you know kind of a field training. And you know, when we started, patients, you know, I mean, it was funny because she was like, "Oh, Alex, you you already you know more about fluvial geomorphology than, than I do." And of course, this wasn't really true at all because you know I, I rapidly realized within like a month of starting that patients had already read half of the papers that I already had been thinking of, and you know, it was. Uh, I yeah I it really taught me how the level I needed to work at to really try and tackle a, tackle a problem. So we spent a lot of time 
uh, surveying rivers and really thinking about some of the assumptions that people have made in, in for example, uh, detachment limited erosion models. We, we spent a long time, for example, to thinking about uh, channel width. Uh, so we had a, we collected a lot of data on on that kind of stuff. And one of the kind of key outcomes from from this work was to to show, I, I guess, for the first time that. Uh, we could actually detect the signature of transient response to uh, fault slip rate increases in the in the landscape. And one of the, the poster childs for this was the, the Rio Torto River cutting across the Fiumiano uh, fault where the, the river long profile had got the kinds of poster child, nick point steep and reach upstream of fault that increased its rate by perhaps a factor of three uh, uh, around three quarters of a million years ago. And, you know, one of the things that really then got us thinking, this has inspired so much additional work, was actually the fact that, well, you know, upstream of this area, it wasn't just that the landscape was responding, but this was the point where all of the erosion was concentrated. This was where all of the material was uh, coming from. So we, you know, we could partition the, the landscape in this football between the area that had high incision and then upstream of this lake point, the area that had low incision. And although, you know, you can look at this as a geomorphic problem, this was also a, a, a problem for thinking about sediment supply from, from catchments as well. So, you know, the, some of the classic things that, that uh, I and others took, a, took away from this was that it was, in general, the case that all of the rivers that were crossing faults that we thought had increased their rate uh, in the last million years, uh, all of those rivers had shown classic signatures of transient landscape response to tectonics. Whereas a lot of the rivers crossing these blue faults that had not really changed their rates or the inactive faults had not, you know, they really were largely concave up rivers. They weren't really showing uh, a transient response that we could particularly detect. So, you know, broadly these rivers in, the, in Italy were consistent with uh, with a, a bedrock detachment limited model of erosion. But one of the key things from this was that the landscape response to tectonics could be bracketed between one and three million years. And I think that was a really important revelation because it meant that you know landscapes, the tectonic tape recorder, if you like, did last over over million year timescales. And that of course then comes back into one of the things that we talked about a lot which was sediment supply. And I remember being in like some gorge with patients and looking at a whole bunch of landsliding. And, you know, we really got thinking about well, where, where is that material coming from? What characteristics uh, does that have? And one of the first things that the patients did, and this is still work that uh, inspires me, is, uh, is a paper that I and others, including Mikhail, who was involved in this project, and Greg Tucker and a whole bunch of us, uh, did was really to what patients really led was trying to couple her fault growth and interaction model with a surface process model. And we use Cascade uh, for this, but where, there we basically looked at how the landscape evolved when, uh, when these faults grew and then subsequently interacted. And this was kind of important because one, these individual catchments, they grew and then uh, shrunk as the drainage areas competed with each other. So, for example, catchment four was big at you know at this time scale in the model, but by this time step, catchment five had captured the lot. But also, of course, that the sediment released from the catchments varied uh, and increased, obviously, as the faults started to interact and and link uh, together. So this really demonstrated that uh, you know faulting. You know, was having a big role on on um, sedimentation. So I guess there are three parts that I would like to kind of stress as things that have motivated me and my my career and my research students, but have also motivated a lot of work from other people and are still working on that. You know, ten years on, one was the realization that that sediment supply signal itself then can modify fluvial incision dynamics. So one thing that you know we originally did was to try and compare, for example, rivers crossing faults in Italy uh, with rivers crossing faults in this case in Greece near the near the Gulf of Evia, which have got similar catchment sizes and faults with similar rates and uh, slip histories, 
and you know what was immediately apparent in this, and I should thank Mikhail Atal for, for for some of these slides, is that uh, you know the rivers in 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 Greece, they you know although they're crossing a fault, you know they they've got you know relatively long profiles that don't show a huge nick point compared to to the rivers uh, that we had I'd just been talking about in in Italy. And of course, one of the key differences is that the upper parts of these catchments are dominated by these sands and gravel units that are supplying abundant sediment uh, to the channel, even though the channel down system is cutting through bedrock. Whereas in comparison, the Italian examples is relatively little sediment being supplied. And we were able to show that that made a su substantial difference to how effectively the rivers managed to cut across uh, faults. One of the things that we saw, for example, this is uh, fluvial uh, efficiency, if you like, on the y-axis, uh, which is a, related to the sediment supply. And this is the sediment supply related to the transport capacity. And we're able to, not only in Italy, show example that we do have a tools effect. In other words, if there's not much sediment, putting more in increases the erosion efficiency. But we're able also to argue in the Greek examples that if you've got lots of sediment in there and you put in more, you basically cover up the bed and dampen the erosion efficiency. And that some sort of parabolic model best uh, explained our observations. And these are relatively consistent actually with the theoretical predictions of Sklar and Dietrich and others. And this kind of view of how rivers behave, you know, lots of people have taken this forward in the last, uh, in the last uh, 10 years. The second thing I want to focus on is that, you know, in the last 10 years or so, I've really ended up thinking a lot about normal faulting and particularly grain size. And that's one of the things that I think, you know, really came from, from some of the work with, uh, with patients. So, you know, we, you know, we, we looked a lot at, you know, a bunch of these rivers crossing, you know, for example, the Fitchino Fault. Uh, you know, they've got classic signatures of landscape transients upstream of the faults. But, you know, they are, you know, the rivers are actually dominated by, you know, upstream in these incised zones, dominated by landslides. And if we actually look at the grain size on the bed down system towards the fault where these black dots are the 84th percentile D50 and these white dots are the median grain size, you can see that the, gra the, the, the grain size really increases in that uh, zone upstream of the fault. So it's not just that you're eroding more sediment, but it also has different characteristics. And I think that matters uh, a lot. And you know, those kinds of questions were also taken forward with patients with some of her work with uh, Stel Mortimer, for example. You know, this is a recent compilation of, of mine I'm still kind of putting together where these are channel grain size against uplift rate for catchments that are broadly the same size. Uh, whereas the ones in red are all of the catchments that are known to be undergoing a transient response to tectonic perturbation. And even where fault slip rates are similar, it's actually the catchments that are responding to faulting are the ones that are actually chucking out all of these coarse rain sizes. So that, you know, that matters, uh, ma that matters a lot. And the final part of this is actually really to do with basin implications. And that's often, you know, this is, you know, my initial conversations with, with patients have kind of inspired where I've gone with this and also where some of my research students and others have gone. So, you know, if you uh, change the amount of sediment and its characteristics coming out of a catchment, you also change what you expect to see in uh, stratigraphy. And we started this problem just by doing some relatively simple numerical models. This is some stuff that uh, John Armitage, Rob Duller, and I uh, were, were involved in, where we built simple models of catchments and uh, alluvial fans bounded by, for example, a normal fault. But we could scale our grain size release to some of the Apennine examples and include appropriate catchment tectonics. And then we basically balance the stratigraphy in the hanging wall and then find the grain size deposits. And what I'm gonna show you is actually not the catchment, but just the basin stratigraphy that we, uh, that we see. So in this example, we basically have run the model to steady state. And at this point here, we have increased the fault slip rate by a factor of uh, five. And we've also, it also increases the grain size that is being released and that's scale to the Italian examples. And that actually produced some really uh, thought-provoking insights. Sure, when, the, uh, when you increase the fault slip rate, you create a combination immediately 
but it takes time for the landscape to respond to that. So you don't have enough sediment to fill up the space, but the sediment that you do have is coarser. And that leads to the counterintuitive result that close to the fault, if we look through this borehole here in A, you get an apparent coarsening in stratigraphy, whereas in B, on the same timeline, further away from the fault, you get an apparent fining in stratigraphy because you've run out of sediment by that stage. So some of these things really kind of challenge some conventional notions of what you expect to, to find in depositional stratigraphy. And that actually tied in uh, a lot with some of our field examples from the, from the Pachinaya Basin. And I think that the key takeaway here is that, you know, transient landscape responses are producing transient stratigraphy over a million year timescales. And I guess I will just finish with saying, well, we kind of know that that's also true in the Italian Apennines where we first stop, you know, started working. I remember talking with patients about this because, uh, you know, we were like, oh, well, we're, we're eroding all of this coarse sediment. But, you know, the Fuccino Basin was a lake until we drained it or until it was drained uh, 100 years ago or so. And the answer is actually that coarse sediment just doesn't make it into the center of the lake. It basically produces these fin fringing alluvial fans. So you just extract all of the sediment. In that. So, you know, it fits very mu much with the central Italian uh, examples. So I guess my three messages are that, you know, a lot of patients' work in terms of landscape and faulting was, you know, really seminal. But in terms of some of my particular focus with sediment supply, we've really demonstrated with some of this field work that it uh, controls the erosional dynamics of rivers, that grain size really matters. Uh, and particularly uh, that, that, you know, then feeds into understanding basin stratigraphy. And that if we believe in transient landscape response to, for example, active faulting, we also have to believe in transient stratigraphic responses to active faulting. And I think that's the really important uh, message. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, yeah, that was a long talk. <laughs> so we're just going to move on to the next speaker directly, I'm afraid. Uh, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and uh, Alex um, can respond directly. Alex or, or, or the speaker. So feel free to contribute to the, to the questions. Uh, you can also share your um, um, experience with patients as well. This is what this is about. And I'm going to let Annaline take over for introducing our next speaker. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so our next speaker is Philippe Steer. So he's an assistant professor at Rennes University. Uh, he did his PhD in Montpellier and Paris, and he came to Bergen to work with Ritzke Huismans, uh, but there he met patients. And uh, so they worked together on, a, on, their, on her nature paper nature paper from 2013 on uh, viscous roots of faults uh, and I think he's an, yeah, an example of uh, yeah the, who has a career that's really inspired by patients work of the interaction between uh, service processes and tectonics. So Philippe the floor is yours. Yeah thank you very much uh, Adeline. So I will share my screen. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, so no, I don't see it yet. You can't see it? Yeah, here it is. Okay, good. Uh, so thanks a lot, uh, Anneline, for inviting me to give this uh, talk in memory of patient Scurry. Uh, so I will talk about a, uh, trying to go um, to have a better understanding of the impact of uh, erosion and topography on deformation. And uh, the subtitle of this talk could be why we need to look for debate and provocative research lines. Uh, so just a bit of, um, of history, uh, how I met patients. Uh, so I, I, I was in 2011, a young postdoc working with uh, Ritzke Wiesmans on the numerical modeling of extensional setting. And we rapidly hooked up with uh, patients when she arrived in, uh, in Bergen a few months after me. Uh, we had very intense and very insightful discussions about the links between surface processes, uh, topography and solidus deformation in extensional settings. Uh, so at this time, I was, for instance, running this uh, kind of couple model between surface processes uh, and tectonic deformation. And we uh, quite often ended uh, with this kind of hook-shaped fault interaction zone uh, that were favored by uh, surface processes. Uh, patient was not directly supervising my, my work, but she 
uh, played a, a role of a mentor and she also was a kind of role model for me. And uh, I think I will always remember this uh, advice she gave me uh, that it is good news when a paper is provocative and fosters debate. And at this time, I, I think it was um, a, quite a, a shock for me because in, a, in the scientific community, we generally don't like when our works are, are commented or debated. But actually, for her, it was a, a very good sign that at least our work was uh, useful and was making uh, the community, community making progress uh, on the field on which we are working. Uh, so because of that, I will therefore present you today not only one, uh, but several provocative papers. Uh, the first paper I will present uh, is um, a seminal paper by uh, Patience uh, with also Chris uh, and, uh, and Joanna uh, about the viscous route of active seismogenic faults revealed by geological sleep uh, rate variation. Uh, so Patience was looking at, uh, at the Apennines and she was in particular looking at the links between uh, the elevation of topography and um, uh, Holocene uh, extensional strain rate uh, that were measured along fault scarps that you can see here on this, on this image. Uh, so what patients basically did was uh, looking at compilation of this data uh, along the Apennines. So you can see on this map uh, the ill-shaded um, topography. And you can also see this uh, uh, green and orange line uh, showing the direction and intensity of strain rate, extensional strain rate, that were measured based on these uh, fault scarps. And patients, she simply actually uh, used some kind of sliding windows along the Apennine. And for each of these sliding windows, she measured uh, the maximum elevation and the, the accumulated strain uh, rate uh, during the Holocene. And uh, she ended up uh, with a, a very simple uh, relationship between strain rate and elevation, where she observed a correlation and that the strain rate was proportional to elevation uh, at a power around 3 to 3.3. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with uh, flow low, uh, viscous flow low and dislocation creep, uh, this exponent of 3 or 3.3 3 uh, must ring a bell, uh, the bell of uh, dislocation creep. Uh, and so to make this uh, link between this uh, empirical relationship and uh, uh, viscous flow low, uh, patients needed to, uh, um, to show that elevation could be related to differential stresses. Um, and she noticed that uh, when you are at yield in a crust, um, you, you need to have actually uh, a proportionality between the differential stress and the maximum stress that is in the uh, vertical direction. And that is proportional to elevation uh, in a context where you are, uh, where forces are dr driven by buoyancy. Um, and so she ended, uh, ended up with a, a proportionality between elevation and the differential stresses. And if you combine this uh, empirical observation between strain rate and elevation uh, with this proportionality between elevation and differential stress, you obtain uh, a proportionality between strain rate and differential stress at a power of about three. And this law directly suggests uh, a viscous flow law uh, by dislocation creep. Uh, so uh, in this uh, approach, she developed a, a simple model of, uh, of crustal deformation uh, where um, if you have a driving stress, you will induce both uh, uh, elastic and viscous uh, flow deformation uh, in the uh, lower crust and uh, frictional uh, slip uh, on the, in the upper crust along the fault. Because you need to remember that this strain rate data uh, were obtained along uh, frictional fault. So in a way, uh, if you have some uh, surface uplift of your topography, uh, you will increase the elevation, you will increase the differential stress that must be relaxed because the crust is at yield. And this will be relaxed by permanent deformation uh, with frictional slip in the upper crust that lead to this uh, strain rate uh, that we observe here and viscous deformation below. And these two deformations will play in parallel and will be in a way proportional to each other. And so the main message of uh, this uh, very nice and very seminal paper by uh, Cohey uh, in 2013 is that uh, we, with this kind of relationship, we can constrain with geological data, uh, this exponent of the dislocation creep uh, flow low, which is, I think, quite unique. And the results that co uh, patients obtain also suggest uh, that uh, um, viscous deformation was actually localized just below the frictional faults uh, in some kind of fault uh, routes 
uh, that were deforming uh, in, um, in, in a viscous way. And we had, of course, a very uh, good coupling between fault slip and uh, this fault foot uh, deformation. And the model of patients assumed that at least during the Holocene, a deformation in the Apennines uh, were uh, governed by buoyancy forces uh, imposed by uh, topography. And I think, uh, at least for me, as a young uh, postdoc at this time, it was uh, this, this paper by uh, patients uh, had a very important conclusion is that topography and topographic changes could uh, govern deformation, which I also feel is a, a provocative idea. And uh, later on, I tried to uh, extend this idea uh, and to apply it to other type of settings, to frictional faults in uh, mountain ranges, uh, where erosion rates could also maybe influence the stress loading rate of thrust faults. So I will now present you uh, another paper that I uh, uh, developed based on this uh, first paper by patients, uh, looking at how uh, surface erosion can lead to fault loading and seismicity. Uh, so the concept or the idea behind this paper is that if you remove mass uh, at the surface of the Earth, uh, you will change uh, the uh, stress uh, distribution uh, at depth, and you will change uh, the stress uh, on uh, potential thrust faults. And what you will do is that you will unclump the fault and increase the normal stress, and you will also increase the shear stress. And if you combine these two increases, uh, you will also change the Coulomb stress on the fault uh, that is equal to the effective friction times uh, the, the increment of uh, normal stress plus uh, the increment in shear stress. So in the following, I will compute uh, uh, stresses uh, along this kind of faults uh, using the Bosinesque uh, point load model, which uh, applies uh, to um, uh, an elastic half space model. Um, and this model allows to sum up uh, individual point loads to mimic some kind of surface uh, distribution of erosion. And we compute uh, stresses on the, uh, on the faults uh, by projecting the, the resulting stress tensor on the fault plane. Uh, so two very simple uh, uh, results, even very obvious results, uh, is that the, the Coulomb stress increment is uh, proportional to uh, the amount of erosion you have in surface. And this um, uh, Coulomb stress increment also decreases uh, with the distance at a power two. So other, in other words, further away you are from the place where you, where you make some erosion, uh, further the, I mean the lower uh, the, uh, the stress increment will be. Um, and I apply this, uh, this approach to, uh, um, to uh, erosion rates that were measured in, in Taiwan um, by Datsun et al in 2003 uh, based on uh, suspended fluxes that were measured before Chichi earthquakes. And these uh, erosion rates are, are representative of uh, some kind of interseismic phase. You can see here this uh, uh, map of uh, ero erosion rates. And I computed uh, how this uh, erosion pattern uh, impacted the, uh, the stress uh, loading of the, of the stress fault on the western foothill of Taiwan. And what we obtain is that the, um, uh, the impact of erosion on the stress loading of uh, these faults was quite uh, moderate. And we obtained some value of about um, a few uh, times 10 to, the power uh, 10 to the power minus three bar per year on this fault. And if you integrate this, uh, this uh, value of uh, stress rate uh, over the length of a seismic cycle, uh, we could obtain up to maybe 0 0.2 uh, megapascal uh, over a seismic cycle, um, which could, in a modest way, maybe influence uh, seismicity. Uh, so this concept, this idea uh, of uh, the impact of erosion on, uh, on fault was later applied to, uh, to other type of settings, and in particular to uh, settings where erosion is not from natural sources, but due to uh, anthropic activities. Uh, here in this paper by Kyuan et al. in 2019, uh, they looked at the Dianjiang earthquake that occurred in the Eastern Sichuan Basin in China uh, that, was, uh, that has the particularity of occurring at a very shallow depth of one kilometer. And this uh, earthquake of magnitude about four um, was, uh, uh, occurred just below uh, an automotive testing site that was built just two years before. And to build this automotive testing site, 
um, they removed about 10 meters of uh, bedrock uh, over a surface area of about one square kilometer. And uh, in this study, they computed the uh, change uh, in uh, the Coulomb stress due to this uh, anthropic uh, surface erosion. And they ended up uh, with an increment of about 0.1 uh, megapascal, which is quite significant. And the, they concluded in this study that uh, possibly uh, this uh, anthropic erosion could have triggered uh, this uh, Dianjiang earthquake. <laughs> Another, I think, very interesting uh, cases where we could also involve this link between uh, uh, anthropic erosion and uh, seismicity is the um, uh, recent earthquake that occurred in uh, southern France, the Tay earthquake that occurred in 2019 at a depth once again of about one to two kilometers. And this earthquake occurred just below a very large uh, cement uh, quarry here that has a size of about uh, one square kilometer and with a total erosion of about 80 meters uh, over a few decades. And in this study by De Novelli et al, they computed that um, this uh, erosion uh, due to the quarry could have uh, increased uh, the stress by about 0.2 megapascal, <coughs> uh, which could have also resulted in advancing the, the earthquake clock by, by about 20 kilo years. <coughs> so in conclusion, I think Patience was uh, one of the first to demonstrate using field data, uh, the role of topography and topographic changes on current deformation. Uh, in addition of a better understanding of viscous deformation in fault route, uh, I think this seminal work has led to several daughter studies. Uh, and these studies, these daughter studies, have demonstrated that natural or anthropic erosion uh, can increase stresses and potentially trigger earthquakes on thrust fault. And I think this, uh, these results have strong implications for earthquake hazards, in particular in regions of low tectonic activity, uh, where the probability of earthquake occurrence is therefore quite likely uh, underestimated. I, want, I would like to thank very much patients and also to thank all the co-authors of uh, the paper I have presented. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Philippe, for this great talk. Thank you. So if there are any questions, uh, yeah, I welcome you to put them in the chat or no in the question, uh, uh, yeah, an answer thing. Um, so Philippe, I was just wondering, so because you were showing the paper of that quarry. So probably that there must be many examples then. Are you trying to compile, yeah, all those sites where you have major quarries and, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not trying directly to do that, but I think um, um, actually people have, have rediscovered a bit this link between uh, uh, quarries activity and, uh, and earthquakes, I mean, triggering of earthquakes. Uh, quite recently, uh, especially by this uh, paper in 2019 by Kyung et al, and more recently by this um, uh, Lutey earthquake in uh, southern France. So I think there will be uh, in the following years some uh, uh, additional paper on that. I'm not directly working on trying to compile data uh, about this link between quarries and um, potentially triggered earthquakes, uh, but probably some other will, uh, will try to do that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I see there's one. Okay, maybe Michael, maybe you want to ask it yourself or? Yeah, I can do that, yeah. So, so my question, that's just fascinating. And I mean, considering how much stuff humans are moving at the surface of the earth at the moment, I mean, we're moving more dirt than uh, natural processes now. And uh, like, is it not surprising that there are no more of these earthquakes happening? Because I imagine uh, you can trigger earthquakes, but you can also potentially like suppress them if you have sediment deposition or things like that. What, what, what is your thinking here? Yeah, yeah you're completely correct, uh, Michael. You can also have the uh, reverse uh, impact. If you do, for instance, surface erosion at the top of uh, normal fault, uh, you don't expect to have exactly that. Um, but I think also it's not, um, you don't expect to have all, always this uh, direct link between, um, uh, um, for instance, uh, removal of uh, rock mass at the surface and earthquake triggering. I think these cases are quite uh, uh, spectacular, but um, 
in a kind of probabilistic way, uh, it will not maybe be so easy each time to, to have this uh, kind of causal links. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thanks again, Philippe. We have to move on to our next speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce Sofia uh, Peklibanido. So she is from Greece, but she's now in Bergen. Uh, so she did her PhD um, at the University of Thessaloniki, and she came to Bergen in 2014. So she has worked with patients for many years. Um, yeah, on, mainly on Greece, so first on Spatials Basin and now mainly on Corinth. Uh, and she's using a combined approach of numerical modeling. Uh, and now she's also involved in the IODP uh, stratigraphic analysis. So that's the, one of the recent course that was drilled in Corinth. So, Sophia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Annaline. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so uh, it's a great honor for me uh, to be here today in this uh, symposium dedicated to the outstanding work of patients. Uh, I was extremely lucky to um, have patients as my postdoc supervisor at the University of Bergen, where we worked very close over the last uh, six, almost seven years. And I have to say that all these years I've learned so many things from her, not only related to science, but I, I really got life lessons uh, from her and I feel very grateful for that. So as it has already been said by the previous speakers, uh, patients used a lot of numerical models uh, in her work and she was always trying to validate this somehow with field data. Uh, in the slide here, you're looking at a photo from the Corinth Rift in Greece, where a wealth of field observations exist both onshore and offshore, that makes this place as an ideal natural example for model calibration. Of course, uh, this area uh, attracted patients' attention a long time ago, and she was actually one of the persons involved in, main, in the initial IUDP proposal for the Corinth Gulf uh, that took place uh, a few years ago. So today I will show you the modeling work I did with patients aiming to understand key controls on sediment production within the current Rift. And uh, as I'm also a member of, the, of this uh, IODP expedition, I will show you some of the recent results that we got from this expedition really, uh, con uh, regarding sim Rift stratigraphic de development. So, the Corinth is in central Greece, and it's one of the um, uh, most actively extending areas in the world, with extension rates reaching up 15 millimeters at the western tip. Uh, it is a seal-controlled drift that is now at sea level, and uh, it is connected to the open sea to the west through the Rion Strait, where water depths are less than 60 meters. Therefore, during sea level falls, this connection was lost, and the gulf was turning into an isolated lake. Uh, it is generally considered by many geologists and geomorphologists as an ideal laboratory for understanding structural and surface processes interactions. This is because uh, this is a young rift with a relatively simple tectonic history and without overprint. Rifting began further south and has migrated north into the Gulf at around 2 million years ago. And subsidence is uh, now controlled mainly uh, from this north dipping normal fault along the southern active drift margin. Another reason that makes this area as an ideal place to study structural and surface processes interactions is the unique combination of high strain and sedimentation rates with the fact that this is a self-contained small rift with a closed drainage system, as you can see here from the Google Earth image, that actually allows us to characterize an entire tectonic and sedimentary rift system. Finally, as I mentioned, there is an excellent field data coverage with the scenery stratigraphy the last two million years, uh, well preserved offshore, and other phases are uplifted and preserved onshore, mainly along the northern and the southern active drift margin. So I will move on, on to the surface process modeling. Um, our aim was to evaluate the key control from sediment slugs into the Gulf over the last 130,000 years. We use this time window because this is simply where we had the best constraints for model calibration. 
the model that we use is pi badlands, and here you are looking at the present day topography uh, of the rift that served as our initial surface into the model. This model simply erodes sediment onshore based on a stream power law and uh, deposits them into the marine domain using a marine diffusion. The main inputs that we use uh, was, um, the, first of all, the cumulative vertical displacement map that you are looking in the slide that was imposed uniformly over the 130,000 years. In this map, red shows subsidence, green shows uplift. Uh, this map was generated using a linear elastic dislocation model based on the geometries of the mapped offshore fault that you see here with uh, red lines. And it was validated based on the quaternary uplift rates of these faults. Here are the slip rates that we use to validate this map. And note that the highest uplift rates are concentrated mainly along the central uh, part of the reef uh, for this time period, at least. We also use erodibility maps that you are looking here based on the map on shore lithologies. Uh, we define three main erodibility groups with low intermediate and high erodibilities that you can see with different colors. We also use a global sea level curve that we corrected based on the lake coring flow stands to include fluctuations of the base level. The flat areas here are, uh, correspond to, air, to the time intervals when uh, coring towards a lake. And finally, the precipitation map uh, that's based on the present day climatic data. And as you can see, there is a great variability in precipitation rate between the western and eastern part of the reef, uh, with high precipitation rates along the western part, using the high pre existing relief of the Leneva's uh, fault and trust belt in this area. So these are our results. Uh, here you're looking at the catchments that are draining into the gulf that are color coded based on the total volume that has been eroded over the 130,000 years. You are also looking at the model offshore sediment thickness with these greenish uh, bluish colors. To validate our model, uh, we basically compare the volume that we got from the model uh, with the volume that we got from the interpretation of offshore seismic data based on the work of Nixon et al. 2016. As you can see from the table, we got a very good uh, match between model output and seismic data that provided a lot of confidence in our results. So now let's look at a little bit where this sediment comes from. Uh, if we consider the risk margins, uh, the active southern margin and the north margin that is now subsiding, our model implies uh, that actually both margins contribute almost half of the total of source sediment volume. Uh, however, these catchments at the western end, due to their large area, contribute a, uh, a lot of uh, sediment. And uh, we've got a really good match between sediment volume and catchment area, as you can see here from the plot. However, a key result of our model concerns catchment average erosion rates and time average erosion rates. Here in these two plots, you are looking at uh, the a, a variation of erosion rates for the southern and the northern reef margin. For the southern margin, we got a very good correlation between erosion rates and the combination of maximum relief and uplift rates that we didn't see for the northern margin. However, erosion rates vary um, fairly similar between uh, both reef margins, and this is something that we didn't really expect. So erosion rates uh, along the northern margin are similar to that of the tectonically active southern margin, even though this is the one that is subsiding. And in other words, we would expect that the north margin would contribute significantly less than 50% to the total offshore sediment volume. Uh, but this is not the case. So to explore this a little bit more, we did a fairly simple experiment. Um, we ran our model without imposing any tectonic forcing. And we compare that to the original model, model run. Uh, here you're looking at the result of this comparison. Uh, you're looking at the catchments draining into the gulf again, but uh, now are color coded based on the difference in erosion rates between these two model runs. So the erosion rates that we got when running the model normally with the tonic on minus the erosion rates that we got when running the model with the tonic switched off. So what we see here is that uh, the catchments that are lying along the southern reef margin show a negative difference in erosion rates. You see that most of them are colored with these bluish colors. Uh, this implies that we are having higher erosion rates in the run when tectonics is actually switched off. 
Exceptions are these areas close to the falls that you see with red, and also some areas upstream that are related to high pre-existing relief. In contrast, the catchments that are lying along the north margin uh, show a positive difference in erosion rates. You see that all of them are colored with red, uh, which implies that uh, we are having higher erosion rates in the run when tectonics is uh, switched on. Uh, the explanation be behind this counterintuitive, I would say, result is actually the flexural tilting of the rift. So the catchments that are lying along the southern active rift margin are being back tilted at the foothold of active faults, uh, as you can see here in, uh, from this sketch, that leads to decreasing erosion rates at the upper parts of these catchments at their headwaters, and also leads to drainage reversals that we know that have occurred, especially in that area here. In contrast, tilting towards the rift uh, along the north margin leads to the incre increasing erosion rates because this flexural tilting uh, increases rift-directed channel slopes. Uh, this flexural tilting, of course, plays a key role in controlling sea reef sediment fluxes and actually results in a shift in sediment source areas, such as that the north margin would become prog prog progressively more important compared to the southern active rift margin. Uh, this uh, result has implications uh, for sediment starvation in reefs that actually might occur due to increase in erosion rates, uh, decrease in erosion rates, and not necessarily imply uh, need an increase of tectonic subsidence to emerge. So what I've shown you so far were the modeling results that we got that were actually averaged over this time window of 130,000 years. Uh, however, patient vision for that area was to use a high-resolution record for model calibration, and this record became possible through the IDB expedition 381 that uh, provides us with a uh, metrolon record of 1,900 meters of section code. Uh, these are the three drilling sites of this expedition, as I will talk only about uh, this central site here. So, for this site, uh, we've got two main stratigraphic units, a lower one that corresponds to an older rift phase and an upper one that corresponds to the most recent rift phase, and actually consists of this alternating marine and isolated environment. Our uh, results show low sedimentation rates for the marine environments and uh, high sedimentation rates for the isolated uh, lake environment. However, a uh, key result that came out from high-resolution stratigraphic analysis of this uh, unit one uh, is that most of the beds that consist this unit one are gravity flows that actually cover more than 60% of the total sedimentation. The rest is covered by the background sediment. Uh, these gravity flows show a great variety in terms of bed thicknesses, as you can see here from the plot below. And uh, what we're actually trying to do now is that based on this record, trying to investigate what controls the observed thickness variability of these gravity flows and if there is actually an external signal, tectonics or climatic preserved in the strata. These questions uh, sort of brings us back to 2003 and the work that patients did uh, with uh, Hugh Sinclair about uh, the scaling of turbidites. Uh, as a summary, I would just uh, want to close this patient's idea about that area that was uh, by combining this uh, offshore drilling data with surface process modeling, we might have the opportunity to understand the relative roles of tectonics and climate on sediment production and stratigraphic development within reef basins uh, in general. And I would like to close with this uh, photo from patients. It's one of my favorites and it's from our field trip in Greece. She's not smiling, but I can tell you had an amazing time back then. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sophia, for this great talk. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I don't see any questions yet. Um, but so maybe, yeah, so I, I will just, because um, there's also another question uh, to Philippe that's still left. Um, <laughs> But uh, I was wondering, so you, uh, about your uh, tipping the balance work, so the starvation of sediment, that's just because the effect on the southern margin is bigger, is larger than on the northern margin, right? So that the mm -hmm. back tilting effect is... Yeah, the back tilting with... Over the... Yeah, you have back tilting. Uh, along the southern margin that actually reduces erosion rates. 
Mm -hmm. But the forward building along the north margin actually increases erosion rates. And yes, yeah, we can say that relatively speaking, makes the north margin like imp quite important compared to the active southern margin. Yeah, this yeah, is what so we, we actually thing. showed. Yeah, so this is the uh, tipping to the balance yeah. Uh, effect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if this question to Sophia. Here it says, oh, this is Philippe. Good question. I think it, maybe Philippe, you want to ask it yourself or? No, I think that's I think that's Philippe responding to the question that I had put in oh, the chat. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Which I copied the answer because we've got the webinar going on at the same time. Sorry, and we've got questions here. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I okay. just copied the answer. Okay. Good. So, I, mean, I, I had a question for for Sophia. I, I, this work is so this work is so cool. I what, one thing that I remember talking with with patients about. Uh, was the extent in current that, that, that whether the long-term sediment supply is also governed by drainage network evolution, so the loss of, for example, catchment areas on, on, for example, in the in the south, for example. So, do you want to? Could you comment a bit on on that? Because that's always something, not just in Corinth, but in other places that you know I've uh, you know struggled with, I guess. Yeah, I mean, for the last. Well, for the time interval that we were investigating, uh, we know that drainage reversals and uh, well, drainage divide migration was minimal. So actually, that was another reason that we used this time. We we didn't really want to, to mess with uh, so much complexi complexity uh, in this model. But uh, yeah, uh, but this tilting effect actually leads uh, because it reduces the slope of the rivers. Um, upstream, uh, it leads to drainage reversals. And I think this is also something Mikhail has shown in one of, well, also you, in one of your papers, um, about, uh, yeah, how this back building can lead us to drainage reversals over time, and uh, therefore to, to re reducing uh, sediment supply. Thanks so much. Yes. Uh, I think we, we have to move on. Uh, so thanks to all the speakers. Um, so we have yeah just six minutes left. Um, so the plan. Oh yeah. So maybe Mikhail, do you shortly want to ask the question to Philippe or? Okay. Yeah, I can do that quickly because I try to copy and paste the thing, and you can't copy and paste from the Zoom chat, so it's a bit of a disaster. So, uh, so there was a Julian Juliana Rossi had a question for Philippe, which was congrat congratulations on you, on your nice presentation. In the relationship between the differential stress and elevation, what about if we consider also the pore pressure and saturated media? So uh, do you want uh, uh, Philippe to just respond to that, please? Yeah, I can, I can answer. <laughs> Maybe Chris also can answer if he prefer, because he's probably more a specialist than I am. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it will not change a, a lot of things. We will just need to, uh, to account for hydrostatic pressure um, instead of lithostatic pressure in the, in the model. Uh, but I think it will not change the, uh, uh, the fact that the crust is at tilled and when you uh, have surface top lips, you will lead to deformation. Um, and therefore, you will get this, the same type of relationship between strain rate and elevation. It will ju just change maybe a bit uh, the relationship between strain rate and differential stress, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so five minutes left. I was just, so I will just uh, show some pictures of patients um, just to finish off with. Uh, so. so, um, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, Chris for some final words about, uh, yeah, you wanted to say something about patients, her character and her transformation as a student. Do you want to do that, Chris, now or? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, when you're teaching PhD students, you're always looking for a point where they change from being a student and just accepting knowledge until they realize they're creating new knowledge. And sometimes you see a big change 
at that time. I, I never saw a greater change in that than with patients. Patients had actually been at Lamont for about two years before she started working with me. And she'd actually been working in marine geophysics and had a blow at a falling away with her advisor. So she stopped and she was looking around for, for some new field and some new topic. And so she came and saw, saw me. And at the time she was sort of, sort of, in a, seemed sort of lost and a little bit depressed perhaps. And anyway, I, I put her on this project and within a month, she just changed completely. Just enormous, I think enormous change. She just, I think she just got the deeper implication of what she was working on. And it just affected her enormously. So she just adapted, she just took off. And she just, of course, her thesis was a tour de front, tour, tour de force. And then uh, I was just uh, in awe watching her develop during her, her career afterwards. It was the most amazing thing uh, that happens to rare people that actually suddenly get that inner inspiration of what it's all about to, to do science. And she is a great example of that. Is, everyone's talked about. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so I think I will just end with thanking everyone because we have only two minutes left. Um, but um, so the webinar will stay open for a bit longer. Uh, otherwise, it will be a very abrupt ending of this uh, session celebrating patients. Uh, so I welcome everyone to stay a bit longer. Um, so yeah, Again, I want to thank all the speakers and EDU for supporting uh, this session. And I think it's, yeah, this session illustrates very well her great contribution to science, but also, yeah, the way she inspired so many of us and especially uh, younger science, scientists. So thanks everyone. Thanks for joining today.